Every day, from Monday to Saturday, more than 24 million people work to maintain the socialist machine of North Korea. This is the present-day result of a unique political experiment that's been running for almost 70 years. It's all at the expense of an isolated and subjugated people, or as those we spoke to during our visit prefer to say, a people protected from the outside world by the leader. The son of Korea is how the great generals are referred to in children's songs. Kim Jong-un's exact age is a mystery, even to North Koreans. Like his father and grandfather before him, the young general is head of state in a country at war. A country with a growing economy. And a country which, however cautiously, is gradually opening its doors to investors and tourists but at the same time remains inaccessible and mysterious. Pyongyang, the flatland, is the center of power for the North Korean regime. The capital city and the face of the republic it's where we'll spend most of our time in this almost completely unknown and isolated country. A few months ago, biology professor Kim Chol Ho was given the keys to his new home. He now lives in one of the most modern buildings in Pyongyang. At the entrance is a poster reminding citizens that at any time they should always be ready to show respect to the great leader, Kim Jong-un. Inside, we're given a warm welcome by the proud owners of the large 240-meter flat, a gift from the marshal to his indispensable scientists. It's an incentive to work harder and more quickly, says Chol Ho. <laughs>
A sickle, a hammer and a brush in the center of Pyongyang symbolize the solidity of the country's only political party to hold power. Almost 90% of all members of parliament belong to the Workers' Party. The remaining seats are taken by representatives of the dependent Social Democratic and Chondoist parties that have no real power. There's also a handful of so-called independent members. The last parliamentary election was held earlier this year. Kim Jong-un was re-elected as a deputy with 100% of the vote from the same assembly that chose him as the country's supreme leader. That was two weeks after the death of his father, Kim Jong-il, eternal general secretary of the Workers' Party. Kuro Kim Kyo-son is a farmer just like his father before him. He's worked at the Miko Collective Farm for eight years. He joined after leaving the army where ten years of service is obligatory for almost all men. Working to uphold the system and achieving goals set by the government is a question of honor. Agricultural workers are constantly reminded of this by propaganda that's widely distributed throughout the collective farms. Loudspeakers broadcasting rousing music and speeches call farmers to their daily work. Students with revolutionary flags and flowers take turns to boost the farmer's morale. The slogans encourage everyone to be patriots and surpass the entire world. Or at least to follow the great marshal's example and contribute as much effort as he does to ensure that his people thrive. Certificates on the offices of this glass factory proudly honor employees of the month and year. 
Last month, Oh Young Nam broke not a single sheet of plate glass while packing. He considers that an achievement. <laughs> Students pursue the same goals. At least that's what's said in front of a camera. To serve my country, says Ji Chong Hyuk. In this case, he's talking about technological research. He's on his way to study at the country's main library, the Grand People's Study Palace. Even prisoners are bound to contribute to the stability and development of the North Korean system. The exact number of convicts is something else that's kept secret. The punishment for any felony is compulsory labor or, for less serious offenses, community service. That's what we were openly told by Alejandro Caudabelos from Spain. As president of the Korean Friendship Association, he cooperates with the government. He helped sort out all the issues we had to face to enter the country, and he'll accompany us throughout this trip. Creemos que la persona que es un criminal que se ha probado su delito y que ha sido juzgado y sentenciado eh, debe eh, devolver a la sociedad eh, al menos parte de ese daño que ha hecho. Y no creemos que deba hacerlo drogándose en prisión, como en el caso de España o otros países, eh, o sometido a todo tipo de eh, vida eh, corrupta y con uh, todo tipo de facilidades, eh, como en otros sistemas penitenciarios. Creemos que debe trabajar al igual que los propios campesinos que cosechan el arroz para dar de comer a la población. Así que sí existen trabajos forzados que no son campos de concentración. No tenemos prisioneros políticos. Ahora, si eh, tenemos un gobierno, tenemos una Asamblea Popular Suprema, que es el Parlamento, que dictamina una ley, esa ley debe ser seguida por los ciudadanos. Por lo tanto, eh, cualquier persona que tenga eh, una idea diferente debe expresarla por los cauces adecuados, no creando, por ejemplo, un conflicto social o destruyendo el mobiliario urbano. ¿Mm? Fields, construction sites and mines are the most common destinations for prisoners sentenced to punitive labor. A foreign ministry official recently confirmed to a handful of journalists that there are indeed special camps for this kind of labor. Some agencies say their purpose is to reform criminals. High treason and subversion carry the death penalty. General Jang Song Tak was executed last year. He was the young marshal's uncle and thought to have been his mentor, the second most important figure in the country. A military tribunal accused him of corruption and plotting to topple the revolutionary North Korean regime. Our visit ends in Pyongyang's victorious war museum. Special effects and music portray the exploits of the People's Army in their struggle against their southern neighbor and the United States. The latent conflict lasted more than 60 years, and North Korea commemorates the end of military action with a grand annual parade, demonstrating its military prowess. Victory Day, as it's known here, marks the armistice in the Korean War. Last year saw the 70th anniversary parade where, as well as missiles, tanks and troops, for the first time ever, Kim Jong-un used the occasion to demonstrate to the world that North Korea had successfully produced its own drones. Mm -hmm. 
There are more than a million soldiers in the regular army, not in And 15% of GDP is spent on the military. Mangyongdai Revolutionary School even prepares children. For the regime, the army is a source of inspiration and, above all, order, defining the precise military way in which society is organized, a society on constant full combat alert. This is a country based on military ideology. Absolutely everything is literally imbued with combative spirit. A metro system more than a hundred meters deep was constructed in the 1970s with help from the USSR and China. This underground space would serve as a refuge in the event of a nuclear attack. A gigantic sculpture graces the southern exit from Pyongyang, where two women symbolized Korean reunification. On official maps, North and South are marked as a single country called the Korean People's Democratic Republic. Just three hours' drive along a rundown but wide, spectacularly clean and practically empty road takes you from Pyongyang to the border. This highway, with limited access, could also be used for military maneuvers. From time to time, you encounter army checkpoints where filming is strictly forbidden. Locals wait patiently in line to show their permits to pass through the barrier. Pan Munjom village is where Lieutenant Colonel Nam Tong Ho delivers military history lectures for visitors. This would seem to be one of the most important tourist attractions in the country. According to the guide, in this very hall and at these very desks on July the 27th, 1953, North Korea and the USA signed the Armistice Agreement without the participation of the South. It was a precarious non-aggression pact that should ultimately have led to a final peace treaty, but never did. There are no South Korean soldiers to be seen along the clearly marked military border today. It's said that they keep it under surveillance using binoculars and cameras while remaining where tourists won't see them. Technically, a state of war still exists between the parties, following the conflict that resulted in millions of casualties and ravaged the peninsula. Several meters away, a group of American Christians, some of South Korean descent, pray for reunification. There are now huge differences between the two sides. Historic, economic and cultural. Even the language has begun to differ. But families living on opposite sides of this divide still try to preserve ties between close relatives torn apart by war. It's a painful issue that's often used as a bargaining chip in talks between Pyongyang and Seoul. Dozens of people from the south, all selected by drawing lots, came to the mountains in Kumpang region in North Korea's east coast in search of brothers and sisters, nephews, and even children they were never given the opportunity to know. After several years, in February, family members separated by war are granted just three days to see each other. For many, it's their last chance. <laughs> I don't involve any of the politics or any of the um, religion part, but we just wanted to, this is a one country and this is a one people. On her second trip to the country in eight years, 
Mrs. Lee met us in Kaesong, the next stop after our trip to the border. First trip was very sad. It was really dark, no lights. You know, during the um, the meal time, lights go off like five, six times, and there are no um, smiles from people's face. But um, now I think uh, it's economically changing. But I think um, uh, some something life, some kind of life is uh, coming back. The differences between Kaesong and Pyongyang are striking. This city is one of the few examples of direct economic cooperation between North and South. The only joint industrial complex is based here. It encompasses over a hundred South Korean companies, employing 53,000 North Koreans. Colonel Kim Chang-yun comes with us to the so-called demilitarized zone which ironically is one of the most heavily armed areas in the world. He's talking about the wall erected on the South Korean side. It was completed in 1979, and Washington and Seoul deny its existence, though they do acknowledge there are certain anti-tank facilities in place. This four-kilometer-wide natural barrier divides the peninsula. South Korea looms in the distance. Seoul is a little over 50 kilometers away. From here, on the North Korean side, and using the colonel's binoculars, we're able to see South Korean military bases flying UN flags on the opposite side. We can also see what the North Koreans are talking about, a five-meter-high wall stretching from east to west. Chang-yong can take pride in just how much trust the marshal vests in him keeping him posted on the main border and in his 40 years of continued service in the People's Army. Revolutionary policy in the DPRK is based on the principles of Songgon, meaning military first, a philosophy that reached its heyday during Kim Jong-il's reign that lasted more than 20 years. The more time passes, the more complex and controversial the concept becomes. A 170-meter tower keeps this fire burning at the monument to Juche. Ideologically, a permissive and slightly spiritual adaptation of communism ascribed to Kim Il-sung. It promotes national and personal self-reliance, or rather, reliance on the masses who are dubbed the masters of revolution and national development. Although the ideology may seem controversial and mysterious, and even dangerous to foreigners, it is constantly referred to. The state-endorsed image of utopian self-reliance and self-sufficiency is in stark contrast to economic reality in the country, which remains dependent on outside help and suffers from an acute shortage of currency. Cargo ships sail into the locks of the East China Sea, bringing goods from China. Still the main supplier of provisions and aid received through international assistance. 
Last year, more than two million people in the DPRK benefited from United Nations aid. Chinese goods fill the model supermarket shelves in Potongang, alongside locally manufactured products which serve as an example of the country's economic prowess. The closest estimate was from the Bank of South Korea. According to Seoul, its northern neighbor demonstrated 1.1% of economic growth in the last year. However, as is so often the case, Pyongyang has released no official data. Small shops and food distribution centers where local people pick up their monthly food rations didn't feature in our itinerary. We were also warned not to film construction sites, and especially construction workers, many of whom are servicemen. They told us that workwear smeared with cement would give a false impression of the country. However, we were allowed to film from afar this footage of the teacher's tower in the capital, along with the construction of a new terminal building and tarmac at the airport, renovation of the May the 1st football stadium, and construction of the five-star Rugyong Hotel, housed in the tallest building in Pyongyang, which is still underway after 27 years of work. Plus many other buildings and complexes whose construction was initiated by Kim Jong-un. <laughs> So we started construction of this museum in September 2012 and under the wise leadership of the president, I mean under the wise leadership of the Marshal Kim Jong-un, we finished the construction within only 10 months. The museum and the weapons exhibitions outside and all the renovations, the monuments, everything was done within only 10 months time. The news block at the state-controlled TV channel focuses entirely on the country's economy. The biggest share of North Korea's GDP is from industry and mining, followed by the service sector and agriculture, which isn't enough to meet the population's needs. Slightly over 15% of the land can be farmed. Tourism and disguised foreign investments are sources of foreign currency badly needed in a country living with sanctions and economic war. Tourists are only allowed to pay in euros, US dollars or Chinese yuan. They have to pay higher tourist prices. The few foreigners who visit the country, many of whom are Chinese, are constantly accompanied by one or several guides. Tourists can't leave their room in the 47-story hotel, complete with five restaurants and souvenir shop, and walk unattended to the casino in the basement. It's leased by a company from Macau. Only twice did we get the chance to walk the streets of Pyongyang. The rest of the time, we were chauffeur-driven in a minivan. Every morning and night, several times a day, this disturbing melody can be heard playing on the many loudspeakers in Pyongyang's railway station. Newcomers are immersed in a nightmarish atmosphere, a funeral march serving to remind all who pass through of the great eternal generals. Every visitor to the capital brings flowers. They must pay their respect to the colossal bronze statues standing at the top of Mansu Hill. North Koreans say that they are required to perform this ceremony each and every time they visit any city. A 
quite remarkable number of literary works are attributed to the great general. Library contains the selected outstanding works of the founder of the nation. There are more than 700 volumes of Kim Il Sung's speeches, books, and plays. One of the best known by the eternal president is a speech calling on the people to support his son, Kim Jong Il, who would soon take over from his father. <laughs> Fumo 우리 이, 이 이분을 대통령으로 모셔 주시오. It's almost three years since Kim Jong Il died. Throughout that time, his image has been closely linked with that of his father, the eternal president. Kim Il Sungia orchids and Kim Jong Ilia begonias grace all public gardens and civic buildings. Images captured by a camera have to be perfect. The taking of partial pictures of the general's statues or photographs marred by lens flare is strictly forbidden. North Koreans all wear special insignia near their hearts. The badges bear portraits of the leaders and among other things they show the wearer's merit and how close they are to the government. We were told that the hardest to obtain depicts the smiling faces of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il together. <laughs> Buildings are generously adorned with their portraits. There are two separate but identical halls, each of which contain the leader's embalmed bodies. The Komsuzan Mausoleum represents the apotheosis in the leader's cult. Photography inside is strictly forbidden. Two seemingly endless moving walkways are decorated with the general's pictures portraying their lives and work. They lead to pharaonic marble halls containing the mummified leaders, surrounded by treasured objects from their respective eras. Armored trains and cars, an array of medals and decorations, even a huge map giving a detailed account of their travels. North Koreans dress in their finest clothes and flock in their hundreds to the mausolea. Today, our film crew was among them. We'd asked that North Korean worker for his thoughts about the new leader's rule. Leaning on a cane, Kim Jong-un reappeared in public after being absent for a month and a half. North Korea's mass media attributed his low profile to his indisposition. The disappearance coincided with our visit, although we only learned of it when we left. The leader, though, didn't seem to have become subject to rumor or gossip, and the few who were lucky enough to see him at close quarters were thrilled. At that time, I were, it was too sudden to see him, so uh, uh, I can't feel it, uh, it was real, so I thought uh, it wasn't just uh, like real, I felt this, it, 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 is it just dream or like that, and later he passed uh, across in front of me, and then I, I knew that I really met him, yeah, my real, in my life, yeah. 
For most, though, daily contact with the exalted leader is limited to the opening minutes of the evening news broadcast, which as a rule report his latest activity. When Kim Jong-in didn't appear in public, the bulletins aired recordings of previous official engagements. <laughs> A sample of what was said when we were able to interview people on the street. Even though this was outside our planned itinerary, no spontaneous responses were forthcoming. Our attendants carefully selected the people we could talk to, and particularly sensitive topics were very much off limits. Los coreanos son muy tímidos. En segundo lugar, eh, ellos no entienden la mentalidad occidental o el por qué se realizan esas preguntas. Normalmente un coreano al realizar esas preguntas pensará que lo está haciendo con alguna intención oculta. Entonces, frente a esa intención, eh, preferirá no responder. De todas formas, aunque pudiera responder, probablemente su nivel de conocimiento está centrado eh, en su departamento, en su barrio. Eh, es bastante limitado. Ideological upbringing and loyalty to the regime begin with early childhood. The first kindergarten in North Korea was reorganized during Kim Jong-il's rule. It's open from Monday to Saturday to accommodate the children of working mothers. In one school hall, three and four-year-olds put on a performance for newcomers. Five children sing a heroic song telling how their beloved leader became a steel commander because ever since he was a child, he'd understood the importance of military force. During a revolutionary history lesson, the teacher shows a model of a fantasy paradise where they say Kim Il-sung was born. They repeat the place and date of his birth. He was born in spring, just like magnolias, says the teacher.
During a science lesson, pupils are told a story about how the great generals once sent children tomatoes, pears and grapes that they had personally picked themselves. A squirrel and a hedgehog are the heroes of the most popular children's cartoon. Agile and smart, North Korean squirrels fight their enemies, ferrets and mice. The quality of animation has been acknowledged internationally. That's why overseas studios hire Korean animators in Pyongyang at very low rates to work on their films. The International Movie Festival in Pyongyang provided the pretext that allowed our crew to secure an invitation to enter North Korea. The Flower Girl represents the classics of North Korean cinema. The screenplay was written by Kim Il-sung when he was 20. It was made into a movie 40 years ago and is now one of the five greatest revolutionary operas. It's the story of a young girl from a poor family who was suppressed by a wicked landlord during Japanese occupation. On the banks of the Taidong River that cuts through the city, everyday life overshadows the exotic and mysterious atmosphere enveloping North Korea. Oblivious to the international headlines, three boys try their luck at casting lines from the riverside while another family takes to the boating. Local teams are replaying a classic game, a match between Barcelona and Real Madrid. But this is the volleyball version. It's one of the most popular sports in the country. People pay a visit to the Chang Wang Beauty and Aesthetics Parlor on Wednesdays a poster displayed near the entrance to the salon features the most popular women's hairstyles. The women usually wear heels and will never let their hair down if it's too long. Among the styles most often recommended by men's hairdressers is the one sported by the country's leader. There's no place for extravagance here either. Excessive attention is paid to order, cleanliness and symmetry in the capital city's streets. 
The harmony and serenity that prevail in the city are there to conceal the controlled lifestyle that North Koreans must observe. The highly paternalistic policy of the state MC. No es que se censuren, es que directamente no permitimos, por ejemplo, influencia de música o de uh, modas exteriores. Eh, entonces, no se puede hablar de censura cuando no es algo que se ha realizado dentro del país que tengas que criticarlo. Eh, normalmente un ciudadano que va a escribir una obra o va a hacer algo, eh, no va a hacerlo contra nuestra ideología, contra el espíritu del socialismo. Eh, por lo tanto, no se puede hablar propiamente de una censura, sino de un bloqueo, sobre todo, de lo que viene del exterior. Using these computers in the People's Palace of Education, access to the country's intranet is easy. It's a localized network isolated from the outside world, full of sex and American propaganda, as one North Korean resident told us. The internet is available to a select few. Scientists and research workers, for example. In 2014, Pyongyang by night has little in common with how it was described a few years ago. The main avenues are brightly illuminated with neon lights and street lamps, although smaller residential areas and streets do succumb to darkness when night falls. Some members of one very popular band graduated from this conservatory considered the most important in North Korea. They say that the five members of the Morangbong band were personally hand-picked by the current leader, Kim Jong-un. The first woman's pop band looks more rebellious than its lyrics actually suggest. This represents something of a departure from the norm in the country, meticulously arranged and monotone aesthetics. Pyongyang은 
김정은 신이께서 어, 우리 우리 항상 지켜주고 계시고 어, 어느 나라 인민이 지켜보듯이 우리 인민들을 항상 어, 용도하시고. In Spain, and a year before preparing for this trip, we spoke to Chue and other aerial artists. Euroso, 지금 이게 유럽 땅에 처음 와가지고선 이스파나 축전에 참가해서 지금 이스파나 사람들로 하여금 우리 주체 교회 예술의 위력을 높이 떨치는 데 대해서 난막 기쁘다는 거 지금 조선 교회 대우로서의 궁지가 많다는 거 어릴 때부터 어 우리 국가에서 이렇게 체계적인 교육을 교육 과정을 골치 갖고선 이만큼 그 훌륭한 교회 배우가 됐다는 거 아직도 국가에서 우리를 훌륭한 교회 배우가 되기 위해서 적극 밀어주고 또그 장차 이게 발전하기 위해서 많이 노력해 주고 이게 부담을 많이 해준다는 거 자기 난 거기서 한 성원으로 써준 교회 배우로서 생활하는 게막 궁진 없고 게 행복하다. Few ever represent their country abroad like they do. Or even earn foreign currency for the system like workers laboring in the Middle East. Not many get the chance to see anything beyond North Korea's tightly sealed borders. One plane filled with workers took off for Kuwait on the day ours landed in Pyongyang. On our way to the hotel, we stared around the unfamiliar streets, certain that we'd be able to gain some insight into the most unknown country in the world. Ten days later, we knew different. An impermeable barrier separating us from them blurs every story we hear about this country, giving it a sense of incompleteness. And that imprecision holds true for the story you've just seen, too. Everything we heard lacked the millions of voices and opinions needed to be credible. What really happened in this faraway land ruled by one young marshal is anyone's guess. <laughs>